Uh, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for joining this conference on statistic border crossings in and beyond translation on behalf of BCLT and the East Centre. And uh, I'll just say a couple of very, very brief words of introduction before we kick off the these two days of presentations. And just uh, to think of statistic border crossings, uh, when I think about this topic, um, one thing that comes to mind is the Russian city of Kazan, which is a, an unusual city because it's shaped by two cultures and two religi religions, uh, Islam on the one hand and Russian Orthodoxy on the other. So when you look at the buildings, you see very often a church that looks a little bit vaguely, strangely like a mosque. And you can't really quite pin it down if you're not a, an architect, I suppose, uh, or a student of architecture, or you see a mosque that looks a little bit Russian, like a Russian Orthodox church. Uh, on the slide here is a very strange building. It's a it's called the Temple of All Religions, and it's a, it's a smart project of an enthusiast in Karhana, which an attempt for in Kazan built in Kazan an attempt to amalgamate different religions all in one, one building. There's a, a bit of a synagogue, a bit of a church, a bit of a mosque, a bit of a, a bit of everything, a Buddhist temple. And if we think about literature in this context. Uh, isn't literature often also a temple to all styles? Uh, a set of texts marked by a history of stylistic influence that doesn't always come from the language in which it's originated, and in fact, more often than not, perhaps doesn't. We know the role of translation in this process. We know that translation helps transfer style from one language into another. Uh, we also know that once translated, those texts influence literature in the target language profoundly. We know a thing or two about how this happens. Uh, but do we know enough? And do we know also how this knowledge applies to other kinds of stylistic border crossings? When, for example, a writer reads, a French writer reads Shakespeare, or a Chinese writer reads Goethe, and that influences the way they write. When uh, a writer thinks in one language and writes in another, how is this kind of stylistic border crossing similar to translation perhaps, and so how is it different? Can we understand it better with translation in mind? Uh, and we don't really think, of, or I didn't think about this uh, until recently as a particular hot topic. Like we think about this as something that, you know, that we can, we can take our time, we can take our time understanding style. But uh, recently, as we were preparing this conference actually, uh, chat GPT exploded, uh, AI exploded. And uh, we started seeing people asking the machine, essentially, asking the machine to produce texts crossing different styles. So far, one language, but nevertheless, and it obliges. And this picture here is uh, drawn, created by AI. Uh, when I asked it, can you please create a picture of Anna Karenina in front of a train in the style of a stained glass window? And it produces uh, actually quite lovely picture. So as we start off these two days, uh, let us start thinking both about the range of stylistic border crossings in literature uh, and their importance. And the way the study of these different kinds of literature, different kinds of uh, stylistic contexts can perhaps help us understand each other and ourselves. Um, and with that, I'll turn over to Duncan Large the academic director of BCLT, and um, he'll take it from here. Thank you very much, Eugenia. Welcome, everybody, on behalf of BCLT, the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. If you've not encountered BCLT before, we are a research centre within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at UEA. We run a public programme, which includes an annual summer school in literary translation and creative writing, an annual public lecture, the Zebat Lecture, which will be given online this year in just a couple of weeks' time on the 23rd of March by Alberto Manguel. Our research program includes a series of online research seminars, book launch symposia, and larger conferences such as this one. Further details of all our activities are available on the BCLT homepage, that's bclt.org.uk. 
and recordings of many of our past events are available on our BCLT YouTube channel. Now, it's been a great pleasure to host Eugenia as Lever Hume Trust Early Career Fellow at BCLT over these last nearly five years. And this conference represents a fitting capstone for her project and her work at UEA. We're delighted to have been able to include so many excellent presentations in the program for this event. Welcome to all our speakers and welcome too to our wider audience who are logging in from right around the world. I'm sure we have a wonderful academic program ahead of us. Uh, it's time to cut the tape and move on to our first session. Uh, so our first session is a plenary talk titled Beyond the Translation of a Poem, and it's going to be given by Jean Bosbeyer. Jean is Professor Emerita of Literature and Translation at UEA, where she founded our MA in Literary Translation in 1992 and ran it until her retirement in 2015. Her academic work focuses on translation, style, and poetry, and recently on the translation of Holocaust poetry. In 2013-14, Jean was principal investigator for the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, Translating the Poetry of the Holocaust. Jean's book publications include A Critical Introduction to Translation Studies, 2011, Translating the Poetry of the Holocaust, 2015, Translation and Style, 2020, and the co-edited volumes, Literary Translation, Redrawing the Boundaries from 2014, Translating Holocaust Lives, 2017, and the Polgrave Handbook of Literary Translation from 2018. Jean is also a translator and editor of poetry, and since 2000 has been translations editor for ARC publications, with whom she's published four collections of poems by modern German poets and the co-edited anthology, Poetry of the Holocaust, 2019. Now, uh, there will be time for questions at the end of Jean's talk. So uh, just to remind you, as Eugenia mentioned, um, this is a Zoom webinar, so we are using the Q&A function for any questions that you have for Jean. Uh, that's available right through the talk, so do pop any questions in the Q&A, and everyone can see those questions and potentially upvote if you particularly would like to see a question asked and answered. Uh, we're also, uh, as Eugenia mentioned, we're running the chat function throughout for you uh, to, um, to chat uh, uh, during uh, and after the presentation. So that's enough from me. Um, very warm welcome to Jean. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, Jean Bosbeyer for her talk, Beyond the Translation of a Poem. Welcome, Jean. Thank you, Duncan. Um, now, I'm hoping that everybody can see this and I'll, um, you know, try and um, not not linger too long, especially at the beginning, because now I've managed to waste a bit of everybody's time. So I'm talk my topic is beyond the translation of a poem. What I'm going to look at is what happens when a text crosses over from one language to another. Not actually what happens, but what does what happens tell us about the source text. That's what I'm going to be looking at. Um, and I'm using poetry as an illustration simply because it's it's easy to show, fairly easy anyway, to show a short uh, text and you see everything in a more, compre uh, more compressed way. Um, but what I say will apply to any literary type of text and, and in fact to many non-literary text types as well. So the, first of all, I want to say something about style and translation. And we can't, I think, separate style and translation, really, because literary translation is the translation of style. There's various reasons why I would say that, and, and one could dispute this, of course. Um, something that, that people have often said to me is that in everything I 
right, there is somehow the figure of Roman Jakobson um, in the background or sometimes in the foreground. Um, and I think the reason for this is that um, he was very, he said a lot about the multilingual origins of stylistics. So he linked style, the stylistics being the study of style and translation um, in, a, in a very important way and showed that they were linked with one another. And he said that um, his understanding of style, and of course his understanding of style was very important for the further development of the subject that we now call stylistics. Um, and he founded the uh, the Moscow Linguistic Circle in 1915, but then left and went to Prague and helped found the Prague Linguistic Circle and then went to Denmark and, and to Sweden and ended up in, in America. So he went just about everywhere. But he was very influenced, he said, in his understanding of style by his study and reading of Czech poetry, of French poetry, particularly the poetry of Malami, of English poetry, uh, particularly Gerard Mundling Hopkins. And he was interested in what happens when you look at two languages together, you look at a text in two languages together. One of his examples, which you can see there, very simple example, death is feminine in Russian and masculine in German. This doesn't make it difficult to translate, of course, and he wasn't actually interested in that. But he wanted to know when you translate from Russian into German, the text which is about death, and the figure is masculine in German, so that changes everything. What does that tell us about the fact that it was feminine in Russian? So it's not so much problems of translation, at least not what I should be looking at here, but it's what does translation tell us? Um, it's very important, and this is something that Jakobsen said often, um, to distinguish between what you can choose and what you can't. The style of a text reflects what can be chosen. The syntax, um, the grammar of a language is, is fixed in many ways, but the style is open to choice, so it's personal. It's linked to personal context, background, worldview, attitude, experience, and the vision, vision of a particular writer. So style is actually something cognitive. It, it relates to the way that we think and the way that the person writing or the person speaking in the text, who may not be the writer, might be a character, a narrator, the way that person thinks. Um, this was expressed by um, Roger Fowler as style is mind style. So the style in a text is actually something which takes us to a mind. Um, and of course, there are different ways in which that can happen. And I'm going to look at one particular way. And this is the notion of divergence. But also, there's a couple of other things on there, um, comparative reading and what that actually means. Um, and it also says thin places there at the top, you can see. Um, something that I'll say something a bit more about in a moment. Divergences between the original and the translation. This is a quotation now from a book by Tim Parks, where he was writing about um, novels and their translation into Italian. And he said, divergences between the original and the translation point to the peculiar nature of the author's style and the overall vision it implies. That's a quotation from the original version of his book. The later version doesn't include this particular bit um, because it was in the preface, but it, it's actually um, important, I think, the way he phrased it, the overall vision it implies. Maybe he took that out later because he didn't want to imply it was only the author. Um, I don't know. But anyway, this idea of vision that you can get to through the through places in the text where you see that the translation is very different. That's interesting. Well, I find that very interesting. And I have developed this in, in various bits and pieces that I've written. Um, 
so that we, we can say that reading a text together with its translation leads to more awareness of the style of the original. And I've called that comparative reading. Um, the reason that happens is because the reason that these divergences tell us something about the original is because the more important an aspect of the style is to what's going on in the original text, the, the more it changes when it crosses a language boundary. Another way to look at this is to say that changes that happen when we cross a language boundary indicate something that I like to call a thin place in the text. Um, I have, of course, taken that term from somewhere else. It's uh, originally uh, familiar to, to uh, many people from Celtic mythology. Uh, it's a place in the world where you, you are close to the other world. So, you know, you might go down to the bottom of the garden and experience the fairy folk, or you might, th th that sounds facetious, but you might go into a wood uh, which might be sacred. Um, it's also been taken up into early Celtic Christianity and, and many later versions of Christianity. Um, and it also appears in many other types of, um, of cultural and religious settings. So a thin place is somewhere where we feel something else, the other world, have access to it, could be the divine we have access to. Um, we might think of Walter Benjamin and looking at how languages fit together and give us an insight into the pure language. Um, but this is slightly different. And the way I'm using it in this comparative reading is that it gives us insight into the mind of the author or the person speaking. So these are thin places, divergences between the original text and the translated text throw up thin places in the original text. And a thin place in the text is a place where you can see what the writer was doing with the language. So that's a fairly simple idea of what, um, what comparative reading might do. Now, in order to find out what the style in a text is doing, um, we need to look at patterns in the text. So here's Jakobsen um, popping up again, saying we identify style in patterns in the text. And by the way, these dates, that these references that you will see on the uh, PowerPoint in brackets, they relate to a list of references which are at the end, which I probably won't show you because it's always strange to look at these things um, on screen, especially when it goes over several screens. But I hope these will be available uh, later to people if they want to have the references. So Jakobsen said we identify style in patterns in the text. Berman um, said patterns change in translation. So comparative reading helps point to important patterns, but that's me actually, that's not Bellman, saying that comparative reading helps point to important patterns. Bellman was perhaps um, pointing to something that might be a problem for translation, that we, we might lose patterns. The way I'm looking at it is that patterns inevitably change. This is not a bad thing. Um, translation inevitably makes changes and must make changes. And it's the nature of those changes that we need to look at. Fauna again said, stylistic patterns give us access to the mind, as we saw in mind style, and as I would put it, to the poetics. So the poetics, um, I understand, as the link between thought and style in the mind of the poet. So in some sense, we can we have access to the poetics that drove the text. Always remembering, of course, that we don't get the poet or the writer of the prose text because poetics doesn't just relate to poetry. It means it comes from the idea of making a text. Um, we don't just have the author immediately there, even in a thin place for access. It could be a narrator who might not be the same as the author, though we might sometimes make that assumption. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do now is give you an example. Um, I hope everybody can, can see that clearly enough. This is a poem by Wilfred Owen, who is um, an English poet of the First World War, probably the most famous poet of the First World War. And um, he was born actually uh, not too far away from where I live now and am now, from where I'm speaking to you. Um, I'm speaking to you from Shrewsbury, by the way. He was born in Oswestry. Not that that's actually relevant. Well, perhaps it is. He was born in 1893 and um, this that you see here, Futility, it was written in 1918, just before he died in the war in northern France um, and just a, a very few weeks, in fact, a few days, really, before the end of the, the he died before, just a few days before the end of the war. And he wrote this poem a little bit earlier in that year. Um, just to tell you what it's about, because we don't have, have time to read it long enough to find out what it's about, and I'm be, I'll be looking at the style, but you do need to know what it's about. He describes a soldier, um, and uh, this soldier needs to be moved because the speaker in the poem um, exhorts fellow soldiers to move this particular soldier so that he might wake up, um, but he can't wake up because he's dead. So it's a it's a sad little poem, one of Owen's most famous, and um, it's this is the poem I want to look at. And I should say that this is an excellent translation by Joachim Woods. And if you're going to do a comparative reading, you obviously need a very good translation because what we're looking at is what changes because it changes, not what changes because. The translator was incompetent or something like that. So this is in no way a criticism of the translation. It's to look at what changes because it changes when it crosses a language boundary. Let me read the poem to you. Futility. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once. At home, whispering of fields half sown. Always it woke him, even in France until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. Think how it wakes the seeds. Woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all. I will just very, um, not very quickly, or you won't understand it, but I will read you the German just so you can get the sound of it. Leg ihn doch in die Sonne, zart hat ihr Strahl ihn einst geweckt, daheim, von Feldern flüsternd, halb gesäten, stets hat sie ihn geweckt, in Frankreich gar, bis auf diesen Schnee und diesen Morgen. Könnte ihn jetzt noch etwas regen, die gute alte Sonne wird's besorgen. Denk, wie sie immer weckt die Samen. Einst, einst weckte die Stäube eines kalten Sterns. Sind Glieder so teuer erworbene, Seiten so durchnervt, noch warm, nicht mehr zu stören. Sollte so groß der Staub nur dafür werden. O oh, was liest dumme Sonnenstrahlen streben, je einzubrechen in den Schlaf der Erde. Um, you'll see a few things there marked bold, at least I hope you can see that. Um, these are the most obvious divergences when we read this poem in English and in German. I'm kind of for simplicity now going to assume that the narrator, the person who says move and think um, or leg and think, that the narrator is actually Wilfred Owen. Um, there are all sorts of problems with making this assumption, but I'm going to do that for the moment, simply because it's easier and also because it's the assumption we do make when we read the poem. Now, let's look at these particular points of divergence. So that's the first one. Um, in the German, it says, and this is at the end of, just go back, you can see at the 
end of the first stanza and the beginning of the next one, you've got know and think, and you've got in German, besorgen und denk. The difference is that the English says, the kind old son will know, think. So there's obviously a different, there's obviously a, a kind of connection between know and think, which isn't there in the German. It, it can't be because you have to make, uh, you have to, you have to change things in order to do what you think is most important in the translation. But what this points up is something about the connection between know and think, which we might not have otherwise realized. So this is the question this throws up. What is the link between knowing in stanza one and thinking in stanza two? Now, going to look at a few more of these differences. Um, the first one, I hope you can see that some things are underlined, and these are what are usually called slant rhymes. Sometimes they're referred to as half rhymes or para rhymes. There's different terminology, but they're these things where it does sun, sown, once, France. Snow now, no is slightly different because snow and no are actually rhymes, and now is actually an I rhyme. Um, seed, side, star, stir, tall, toil is another one. So these are so called slant rhymes. Now we can see in the German that you haven't got slant rhymes, that they are extremely difficult to do in German. Um, I haven't looked into why that is so. They're possible, um, but they're difficult. You've got various assonances. So you've got at the end, for example, werden, erde. You've got lots of alliteration, um, stäube, samen, sterns, seiten, and so on. So all these S sounds that are underlined. Some of them aren't underlined, but you can see there are lots of them. Um, so that's a difference. The fact that there are different sound patterns in the German makes us then think, OK, is this about sound patterns or is there something that makes the slant rhyme important? Is this something that's telling us something about the poetics of this English poem? Because it, it hasn't gone easily into German and maybe he didn't want to do it. Um, the other thing it does, looking at the sound patterns in this way, is make us see other assonances in the original poem. So we that you can see those in bold, awoke, home, sown, woke, no. Um, so there's a pattern of assonance there in the original, which becomes apparent when we start to think about the nature of these rhymes. The biggest change we find is in the final three lines. Um, and there's something very different there. It, um, this is the slant rhyme, which is different, but which I've already mentioned, but also you get this clays of a cold star, a bit further up that stanza, and Stäube eines kalten Sterns. Uh, Staub is dust. So here are the last three lines. And you've got a gloss for the German. And what it says is, Sollte so, uh, sollte so groß der Staub nur dafür werden? Should the dust become big only for that? Um, and the next line just shows where you've got the alliteration, but then it goes, je einzubrechen in den Schlaf der Erde. Now, the difference is, the slant rhyme, as I pointed out, is different. Um, but also, the difference between dust and clay now, in, in English, it's, was it for this the clay grew tall? In German, you've got, was it for this the dust became big? It's strange in the German, dust became big. But more than that, when you look at the English, of course, it's strange in the English too, but it is very different. And of course, you ask why? Well, one reason is because the word for clay in German, it's not so clear because you can say lehm if it's if it's clay on the ground in the earth, but you can also say um, torn, which is the which is the clay that the potter uses or torn erde. <clears throat> so it's it's slightly difficult. It's not quite the same. It isn't kind of isn't kind of a one to one correspondence. Um, also, groß in German, which I have glossed here as big, can mean tall, but of course 
dust isn't likely to grow tall. That's even less likely to be the case than clay. So um, there's something happening here which is very different. And I've summarized the questions it throws up in this way. Again, the question, is the slant rhyme important in itself? Um, and we ask that because it's not there in the German. There's something else in the German, but it's not actually slant rhyme. What is the significance of the clay grew tall? And we ask that because we don't have that in the German. We have the dust growing big. And is it possible that clay grew tall appears more concrete? Um, so that's something I'm going to look at again. And also, why is at all, which comes at the end, just go back to that, um, to break a sleep at all, that comes right at the end of the poem. Um, at the end of the poem in German, you've got the word Erde, and the ever, which is sort of the equivalent of at all, isn't at the end. So it's not really noticeable. In, in the English poem, the at all that the poem finishes with is foregrounded. It really stands out, partly because of the slant rhyme and the rhyme with tall, but also because it's right at the end of the poem and it seems a kind of odd, quiet note to finish the poem on. Um, I've given you references to Shklovsky and there uh, from uh, one of the Russian formalists and uh, Mukhajovsky, uh, one of the Prague structuralists who wrote about foregrounding in particular, but lots of other people did. Um, and of course, we also think about the difference between at all and ever, and the fact that it's, when you look in the German for at all, and you find something in a different position and something very different, which works very well in the German, but it's different, you then think, well, is it then the case that this at all is maybe really, really important? So these are the four questions that I think through the comparison of the English poem with its German translation are the most obvious ones which the divergences throw on. What is the link between knowing in stan the end of stanza one and thinking at the beginning of stanza two, which is not there in German? Is the slant rhyme important because the translator has done something different? What is the significance of the clay grew tall, a phrase which is in in itself odd, but doesn't seem to go easily into German. And why is at all foregrounded? Which we might not notice, but we notice it because we see that the German has done something different and we think, hang on, what was it doing in the English? And you see that the at all phrase at the end is definitely noticeable. So I'm going to attempt now to give you some answers to those questions. And of course, what happens when you try to highlight a lot of stuff on a short text? And I did take a very simple text by Owen because otherwise you end up with the whole thing in different colors and fonts and nobody can see anything. Um, what I've tried to do here is mark a few things in color. I've also tried to use different fonts in case you can't see the colors very easily, but I hope you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so the first thing to say is this question about know and <clears throat> think, and I've highlighted that that kind of, um, what's the word, connection between stanza what the end of stanza one, the beginning of stanza two, with know and think. And what we see is it's the sun who knows, but it's we who think. Um, and the, the word know in the first stanza is tied into the text by, not just by the slant rhyme and this strange snow now know, which is not even really slant rhyme in the, in the final three lines, but also by the assonance before, awoke, uh, sown, woke, snow, no. Those words all exhibit assonance with one another. So no is a foregrounded word in that stanza. Um, and we think, well, what seems to be happening here is that we think perhaps humans will be the same. So we see 
the, the person has, has been, should be moved into the sun, the soldier. We see that the sun has awoken him in the past and that it awakes everything. It awakes the seeds and so on. So we think of that. But the thinking in the second stanza actually only leads to questions. So the three questions we get are in the second stanza. So there is something about knowing in the first stanza, which is what the son knows. And there's something about thinking, which is what we do, which is not very satisfactory in the second stanza. Uh, it leads to a series of questions and that's all. Um, then secondly, the slant rhyme. Well, slant rhyme is, is actually something quite unsettling to read. It's very strange. Sun sown, one's France, um, seeds, sides, and so on. It's, it's not what, it's never what you expect. It's not quite the same. It's to some extent the same, but it's not quite the same. That is, of course, also true of full rhyme, which is not the same word. Um, because of the first consonant or consonant cluster is different. But full rhyme always sounds expected and um, slant rhyme always sounds unexpected. Well, I would say that the slant rhyme is important when I start to look at it properly from realising that it isn't there in the German and that what the German is doing is something different. I think it's important here because it underlines that the soldier is not the say the soldier is not behaving like the earth the earth is renewed and you think you know if you put the soldier in the sun he will wake up but he doesn't so you've got something which seems to be similar a parallel situation between the earth which is awoken by the sun and the soldier and he isn't awoken by the sun but also between the soldier as he was who once was awoken by the sun, and now, because now he's not asleep, he's dead. So you have these comparisons of things which seem to be the same, but unfortunately they aren't, and the difference is crucial. And that, to me, is echoed in the um, in the slant rhyme that there is here. Um, and, and you can see that there is a parallelism between the, the situation in the world and the soldier. The reason that some of those are red and a couple of them are green is because the red ones suggest awaking, awakening the sun, the warmth, and the green ones, you've got snow, cold and sleep, um, are in a way the opposite. Uh, they're not awaking, they're cold. Um, and so there is there is clearly a kind of parallelism, parallelism going on here. The third question was about clay and did it matter that you had dust where in the original you had clay? Did it matter in the sense that it tells us something about clay? Does clay matter, in other words? Um, clay is, of course, metaphorically that which we are, which we come from and to which we return. That's a common in the Bible. The same is true of dust. So dust fulfills a very similar role to clay metaphorically in the Bible which is presumably where the, or it could be where the image is taken from in, uh, in Wilfred Owen. Um, but it may be that when we speak of the clays of a cold star and the clay growing tall, tall, we mean human substance in a metaphorical sense. And that, of course, is true of dust as well. But also clay is real. And this is the important difference, I think. Um, Clay is not just metaphorical, it's real. And dust probably is metaphorical, but not real. And the reason we think this is because we start to compare dust and clay. Clay was what was actually present in France. Um, we know this because Owen wrote in his letters, wrote to his mum, it's not mud, but an octopus, octopus of sucking clay. That's what he called it. Um, he also described how the trenches were built up on the bodies of his former comrades and how um, the human substance became part of the clay that made up the sides of the trenches. It's a horrible image, um, but war is of course horrible. Um, so it, it's in a sense you have the man in the clay, but you also have the actual real soil 
of northern France, which was really, particularly in the war-torn situation in which they were, um, was clay. So it's, it's metaphorical, but it's real as well. And this final at all point where we say, well, in German, you've got ever, which is slightly different. Um, both of them are similar because you can't use at all positively. Um, it's, it's negative. I never saw that at all. I never went there at all. I never thought that at all. Um, or it could be a question. Um, have you ever been there at all? Um, so it's a, it's a negative or a question, but it, it's, a, it's kind of quite throwaway at all. It's a strange little expression. And I don't know if any of you have heard it sometimes said in restaurants, can I get you anything else at all? And it sounds wrong because you don't use it that well. I don't think you use it that way. It's a strange throwaway little thing. It suggests pointlessness and sort of why bother? And it picks up, I think, the word futility of the title. Well, I'm coming to the end of my time. So I'm going to just simply summarize that as what is the poetics then that informs this poem? And what I would say is um, this, the sun knows and we only think, knows is tied into the poem closely with a series of assonances, think is highlighted by a series of questions. So there's a contrast, the earth and the soldier might seem similar, and you might expect the sun to have a similar effect, but they are different. The sun cannot awake the soldier in the same way as it awakes the earth and the seeds and the clay of the original, so uh, the original star, which is earth, presumably. Um, and that is echoed in the slant rhyme. And the human and the clay are inextricably connected. So cold clay can refer to um, the planet, the earth, clay glows, grows tall, is clearly human. So it's clearly human and earth, but it's also real. And because he says France, you see that you're talking about a real place. So it's metaphorical, but it's real. And that all is foregrounded through the slant rhyme or that kind of odd rhyme of tall and toil itself a slant rhyme, but at all, of course, is just a repetition um, of tall. It explains fatuous. It's foregrounded. Um, it's at the end. And so it, it gives, up a, gives a sense of futility and pick, the, thus picks up the title. Um, I could just stop there, and I will, in fact, just stop there in a second because there isn't any more time. Um, but I do just want to ask, one further question before I do give a summary, and it's this. Now, we've seen that comparing the original poem and its translation in this way can give us a sense of the poetics of the original. But can analysis through comparative reading actually help us to translate? It's just a further question, which a translator will always ask. And my answer would be, well, yes, because we can do a first draft um, very carefully look at what has changed, what has inevitably changed, what has had to change, what has changed in a positive way, this is not a negative thing, um, and that might, those differences might point up ways in which we can better understand the source text and so we can then maybe better translate. So here's just a summary um, of all that I have been saying. Comparative reading of the source text and the target and a target text, a good target text, throws up divergences. Divergences between the two texts are often at a point of particular importance to the style of the original, what I've called a thin place, because style is personal and cognitive. And so at these places in the text that are thrown up by the divergences, you have a sort of very close access to what's behind the poem. This is especially important if it's also part of a pattern, because patterns of style make up mind style. And mind style is what it gives us access to the author's poetics. So if we can regard style as mind style, 
find the thin places in it through comparison, um, we will then get to the author's poetics. And that is what will help us translate. And that's where I'm going to end. Um, as I say, there are uh, references, but I don't particularly want to give those now. Okay, uh, is that all I finished now then, Duncan? So back to you, I think. Thank you, Jean. That was terrific. Um, what a wonderful presentation and what a wonderful uh, introduction to uh, many of the themes, which I'm sure are going to be explored further over uh, the course of these uh, couple of days. Um, thank you for leaving uh, time for questions. So uh, can I invite our audience to uh, please, if you have any questions, pop them in the Q&A. Um, I, perhaps I could um, kick off, uh, Jean. Um, I, I, I'm actually in Germany at the moment, and I was particularly struck. What, what a wonderful example you gave us, and what a wonderful translation the Utz translation is of the um, of the poem. I was um, uh, I, I was struck by um, the the way in which. The syntax of the uh, of the German in Utz's translation is really quite warped uh, as well, and you focused very much on on Lexis uh, and on um, uh, on the uh, phonetics uh, with the the different rhymes and, and slant rhymes. And I, I wonder if you might perhaps say a bit more about the uh, the syntax of the uh, translation, because I think you demonstrated wonderfully how your comparative reading helps us to understand better the style of the original. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the, the style of the, the translation in that respect. Um, I was thinking especially about thin places as well. Um, uh, can thin, are thin places always going to be individual words or can they also um, be um, uh, syntactic uh, elements, uh, rhetorical elements and so on? Um. Yeah, I can. I think I've managed to stop sharing my screen now. Has that worked? <laughs> I'm sorry, I nearly missed your question because I was fiddling about trying to get rid of the screen share. For some reason, it doesn't seem to be easy, uh, or at least not for me. Anyway, um, you asked about the syntax of the of the German, I think, as well, and mm. and also about well, I mean, just to say, as you as you have pointed out, I mean, the German is. A brilliant translation and I've tried to do this exercise with lots of, of different poems and their and texts and their translations and it it only works if it is a really good translation and some of them I've just thrown aside in despair I've had translations of Thomas Hardy which are just so awful that I just you know don't even want to look at them and you can't it's it's not that they're awful I do far be it from me to criticize people really in that way but it's just there isn't anything to see. Now, what's interesting about Woods' translation is that it does, it sounds like Wilfred Owen. Now, that seems a very kind of naive and silly thing to say because, you know, does it sound like Wilfred Owen would have, if he, you know, all that stuff. Um, but actually, it does sound like Wilfred Owen in a very, very kind of, I think because the argument of the poem is the same, you know, the, a poem has an argument, it's telling, it, it's giving an argument to people. And that is preserved, and that's really important. And the level of language, the kind of register is preserved. It's it's perfectly Owen. Um, what it doesn't do is the kind of unsettling nature of the of the slant rhyme, um, because you can't. And you know, I would have put dust rather than clay if I had been writing a German version of this, because it works better in German. Of course, it is then interesting, what does clay mean, as I said? So, yeah, I mean, to, to go on to what you said about thin places. No, I think this could be anything. I mean, I think in a way the slant rhyme itself as a pattern is a thin place for Owen. I think if you, you know, some of us had Owen read to us as, as children, probably. Well, well, I did at school and, you know, was kind of very um, disturbed by the slant rhyme. So in a way you can say, well, I don't need to look at Joachim Utz's translation and, you know, in order to see that uh, the slant rhyme is, is very crucial. Um, but it, it makes me think about it more when because I think, well, does alliteration have the same effect? Well, no, why? Because it isn't something that's similar 
but not quite the same. Of course, it is. This is the, the strange thing. Any type of rhyme is similar, but not quite the same. Um, but there's something particular about slant rhyme which does this, which I think one could examine further. So it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a word. It could be a syntactic structure, uh, anything really. Thank you, Jean. And uh, a, a first question from uh, Khalid Majad. Uh, can patterns be tracked in the same way in prose as well? Can the sorry? Can patterns be found in the same way? Yes, yes. yes. Um, I mean, in Tim Parks's book, he only looks at prose, and he's maybe not so much looking at it from a. Although his book is called Translating Style, he's looking at it in terms of style um, rather than stylistics. If you see what I mean, so I would tend to look for patterns probably slightly more because of my background in, you know, Russian formalism and Czech structuralism and all that kind of stuff that you did. I mean, I don't mean stuff in a negative sense. It's, it's crucial to the development of stylistics. Um, and so, yes, could you find these patterns in prose? You could. Um, you could find them in prose and you do find them in prose. And I have uh, several examples where you can find, I mean, Thomas Hardy, I mentioned a moment ago, if you look at Thomas Hardy's prose, you can see exactly very, very similar patterns. They're much harder to illustrate in a talk because you have to take a great chunk of text and it doesn't quite so nicely, you know, it doesn't have nice rhymes and things. So, but yes, you can find them in any text. And you, I think you find them in advertising texts as well, actually, similar sorts of things. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a, a question from Elizabeth uh, Gomans. Um, and uh, Elizabeth asks, do you have any tips or recommendations for an effective comparative reading, one that sheds light on the divergences? Are there any things in particular you look for? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that is an interesting question because of course I have been looking, uh, I've looked a lot and I, you know, to, to find a thing, to find texts where you can see this. I would go for a text where the translator, you know, this, this is going to sound kind of very naive, but I would look for a text, for a translation that does sound like the original. That's the first thing. It's got to be a good translation. It's got to work. Um, you've got to be sure that this translator has somehow got into the, the head of the poet in terms of voice and, and, the, and the structure of the text um, and the register. And then the difference is, that should be minimal because if the differences are enormous and it, you're just looking at a different sort of a, a text, um, then of course you, you, you won't be able to see any, any of these kind of thin places. So you want something which uh, certainly at first glance looks very similar, um, which is a very good translation and where you can say those differences had to be there. It's what happens when you cross a boundary. They have to be there. And I have to be able to say, why do they have to be there? And I can see exactly why clay has become dust and I can see why the slant rhyme has become alliteration. I can see what the translator is doing and I think it's wonderful. Um, and it's exactly those points that you need to look out for where you say, yes, I see what the translator's doing. And this will then tell me something about the original because it isn't an error or a slip. It's something that, that um, it just simply is important in the original. So that's how I would look for the text always. Uh, uh, Eugenia has uh, uh, thanked you in the chat uh, for your thought-provoking presentation and remarks that it's fascinating to think how much a focus on difference can reveal about transfer rather than loss of style. And um, I was struck by, by one of the uh, elements in the German uh, translation, which you um, didn't pick up on, but I was thinking of, of Großwerden in the German about the the dust uh, becoming big in your translation. But it suggests also growing up, uh, doesn't it? Um, uh, as in a, a child growing up, and that would then be an element which the German translation basically has has introduced, um, perhaps uh, to correspond to the the growing tall. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, Großwerden does work very well. Um, it works, though, in a metaphorical sense. If you see dust mm. as metaphorical, it works perfectly. But the fact that dust works perfectly metaphorically, when you compare it with clay and you think, I think it was uh, Neruda who said um, a, a metaphorical 
owl is still an owl. I, he didn't say it like that. He said something else. So I'm misquoting him. And if anybody knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> please email me because I've been trying to racking my brains the last few days to think who said a metaphorical something, let's say owl, is still an owl. Because that's important because it's metaphorical, yes, but it isn't just metaphorical. And it is real clay. And I think this is this is really the crucial thing about many many metaphors particularly when the metaphor is in a way a thin place itself it is also something real you can't just um you know you you, you can't forget that and i'm quite sure that uh, joachim utz didn't forget that he did what would work in the german and after all it's his translation why why would we want to read um Wilfred Owen's mind in quite the same way in a German translation. We probably don't want to, uh, but it does make it interesting then. Thank you. That that reminds me, um, I, I don't think this is apocryphal, is it? A Freud saying sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he did yeah. say that. <laughs> Um, Ono Costas um, uh, says, thanks very much. Do you feel that Staub, rather than clay, since it's less real than soil, takes away something of the reality of the historical setting of the poem? Yeah, I mean, that, that in a way relates to what I was just saying in answer to what Duncan said, that um, perhaps it does. But then when you translate, you do take away something of the historical setting because you're not writing in the historical setting. setting. Joachim Utz was not writing in the trench. Well, actually, Owen wasn't writing in the trenches, but he was writing just after he'd been there or just before he went back there. Um, of course, Joachim Utz is not writing in this situation. It is a translation. It is a German poem, and we know that. And of course, if you then think, well, it's important that my reader, if, if you're Joachim Utz and you think, well, my reader needs to know something of the original, you put in a contextual note, you explain the situation, because I think to try and do that in the poem somehow is odd, because it isn't Wilfred Owen's poem, it's Joachim Utz's poem, actually. It's a translation. And so I wouldn't say it takes away the context, but I think the act of translation automatically takes the thing further from its context. But that context is still recoverable. You can still look at the original and say, oh, interesting, I've got Staub and I've got clay in the original does that link to the original context it's nothing to stop you doing that if you can do that or researching things about owen so yes it takes you further away but that's what the act of translation does actually thanks jean um a question from uh enora lessinger who uh, earlier um greeted us from abu dhabi so we've got uh, uh audience members really from uh uh, from far and wide, uh, Enora says, thank you for this fascinating presentation. Um, presumably this method would only work for retranslation though. Um, so a question about uh, whether uh, your method of comparative reading, how it, um, how it might differ, I suppose, between uh, retranslations and uh, earlier translations. It doesn't make any difference. Um, it, it, it's, it's just, I, any good translation of a text uh, will throw up these differences because the very fact of a text crossing a language boundary changes that text. Not just that it, it takes it further from its context, but it takes it into a new one. And it also takes it from its original audience to a new audience. So it's these kinds of things, and it takes it into a different culture and a different set of circumstances. Um, and it does move metaphors about, uh, it always does. I don't think it makes any difference whether it's a retranslation, what sort of a translation it is. It only matters that it should be a good and thoughtful translation. Um, that, that's what matters, it doesn't matter otherwise. Thank you. Uh, our time is is nearly up. So uh, let's take one uh, last question, which rather opens things up, I think, um, uh, from uh, Jyotirmai Mishra, uh, who says, hello, Jean, thank you for a wonderful session. This is Jyoti from India, who asks, um, while translating poetry, what should a translator prioritize when genuinely caught between the linguistic limitations and features of source language and target language? I'm especially referring to musical elements in poetry. So there we, there we go, a, a, a very broad question perhaps to, to finish off with. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yes, um, it, of course, one, one could talk forever and don't worry, I'm not going to. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it, of course, you, you, a good translator will do, I think, exactly what, what Joachim Ods did. He will say, well, I need to make my text hang together and I'm going to put in alliteration because that works in the German in a very natural way without it looking added on in the same way that the the sound system, the system of sound pattern in the original worked in a very sort of integrated way. So I think you need, you, of course, you need to accept that some things will change and that's a positive thing. And you, but you need, but, but the original poem made stylistic sense. So it's, it's sound patterns, it's patterns of reference, it's metaphors, they all tie in with the argument that the poem is making. And when you have um, a translated text, a translated poem, that also must make stylistic sense. Its sound patterns must underline, if you want them to underline, what the argument of the poem is. They must be tied into it. The thing must work. And that's what I think is so good about this translation. It works in itself. So you might, you do, I think you do need to focus on whether the text in itself works and produces a good, a really good poem. Um, of course, it it needs to be, have its relation to the original, or you wouldn't call it a translation. But it it really needs to make stylistic sense. There needs to be a reason why you know you say dust if that's what works better in German. There needs to be a reason why you have alliteration. It isn't just because you need some sort of sound pattern and anything will do. You have to work out what fits in the language you're translating into. That's what I would say. So you try and you try and do whatever you can, but you your your absolute goal is to make stylistic sense in the in the target text. Thank you so much, Jean, for your wonderful presentation and for for your terrific uh, uh, responses to uh, our audience's questions. Um, we're going to take a short break now, just under 20 minutes. Uh, we'll resume at, uh, that, at noon UK time, so basically on the hour. Um, and can I just uh, stress that we will be using a different link for the next session. The next session is our first roundtable discussion. So do please check your programs and use the different link for the next session. But for the moment, let's uh, round off our first session by thanking our speaker, Jean Bosbeyer, for a wonderful presentation. There's been uh, a, a great deal of uh, appreciation in the uh, chat already, Jean, and uh, uh, thank you from me and from everybody for launching our event uh, so wonderfully. Thank you.